Hello and welcome to the 16th Nuclei in the Cosmos conference and to the School for PhD students. My name is uh, Maria Luisa Liotta and uh, I'm uh, at the University of Edinburgh. It's a pity I cannot be there in presence, but I hope uh, we'll be able to interact uh, during the group sessions. So today I'm going to uh, tell you something about uh, nuclear astrophysical experiments uh, and uh, particularly uh, deep underground experiments that we perform at the Luna Laboratory in Italy. Um, given that this is the first uh, um, lecture on nuclear astrophysical experiments, I thought I would devote the first lecture to recalling briefly what nuclear astrophysics is all about and then specifically to the way in which nuclear reactions take place in stars. We'll look at non-resonant and resonant reactions, so we'll introduce the concept of reaction rates and we'll also look at the relationship between cross-sections and yields. And then I will present the challenges and requirements that we have to uh, face and fulfill when uh, dealing with uh, studying nuclear reactions in the laboratory. Nuclear reactions, of course, of astrophysical interest. And this will lead me to the question as to why do we want to go underground. And then in lecture two, I will present the Luna Laboratory, highlighting some past successes and then focusing more specifically on some recent studies on gamma ray, charged particle and neutron detection, just to show how uh, going underground can really be beneficial in each of these three cases. I will then finish off by highlighting some future opportunities, not just at Luna, but also other laboratories worldwide. Nuclear astrophysics essentially tries to answer two questions. One is where do all chemical elements come from? And the other, how do stars and galaxies form and evolve? And in trying to answer these questions, it turns out that nuclear astrophysics really plays a key role in linking the microcosmos and affecting the macrocosmos at large through the specific properties of nuclei and the way in which nuclear reactions take place. Much of what we know about uh, um, the universe around us comes from the study of the electromagnetic radiation emitted by quiescent stars, but also by the interstellar medium. Here we see the characteristic gamma ray line associated to the decay of aluminum 26, and gamma rays emitted during stellar explosions, so supernovae or novae and also X-ray bursts. We also have more direct messengers in the form of neutrinos, most notably those coming from the Sun, cosmic rays, meteorites, lunar samples, and more recently also the detection of gravitational waves. When we put together all these pieces of the puzzle, we come up with a distribution of the chemical elements uh, uh, similar to the one shown here, which spans 12 orders of magnitude. And this shows that hydrogen and helium are by far the most abundant elements in the universe. Elements uh, from carbon to uranium only account for 2%. These are what uh, astronomers collectively call metals. And uh, deuterium, lithium and beryllium are significantly underabundant compared to nearby uh, species. And then we also observe that there is an almost, uh, um, well, there is an exponential uh, decrease in abundances up to uh, the iron peak, and then an almost flat distribution of all elements beyond iron. So clearly the question is, why do we observe this distribution and where do chemical elements come from in the first place? And indeed, uh, um, the first uh, um, kind of um, very strong uh, theory about the uh, origin of the elements was put forward by Burbridge, Barbridge, Fowler and Hoyle in a seminal paper that marks the birth of nuclear astrophysics and it's generally referred to as B square FH. What they suggested was that uh, chemical elements, apart from primordial hydrogen and traces of uh, helium, could be uh, synthesized through uh, well-defined uh, stages of uh, um, fusion reactions between charged particles and mostly invol involving stable nuclei during quiescent stages of stellar evolution while the elements beyond iron can be produced through neutron capture processes known as the S and the R process, whereas S stands for slow compared to the beta decay uh, times of um, 
any unstable nuclei produced during the process, and R stands for rapid neutron capture process. And this process is mostly involve unstable nuclei. There are then some elements which are a couple of orders of magnitude underabundant compared to these uh, in green and blue, whose origin is attributed to yet another process called the P process. Uh, and presumably you will hear more about all of these processes in uh, upcoming lectures. So the basic idea is that stars form through the gravitational contraction of interstellar medium and eventually if the mass of the um, protostar is high enough uh, to guarantee that uh, high enough temperatures can be reached in its core, then nuclear reactions can kick in and they will be responsible for stabilizing the star against the further gravitational collapse. They will produce the energy that is liberated by stars and that makes them uh, visible and also they synthesize uh, all the chemical elements beyond uh, as I said hydrogen and uh, helium primordial helium of course helium is also synthesized in stars so effectively stars uh, behave like huge cauldrons in the cosmos and these are the furnaces where chemical elements are produced eventually the more massive stars will uh, explode as supernova re-ejecting back into the interstellar medium all the elements that they've created in their course and in so doing they lead to uh, an enrichment of uh, the um, interstellar medium up to the situation that we observe today. Not all stars uh, um, will undergo um, explosions. Uh, stars like our mass, uh, like our sun, will uh, typically die off as white dwarfs and it's only the um, more massive stars, typically 10 solar masses, that will undergo supernova explosions and then depending on the original mass and the details of their evolution they may end up as neutron stars or black hole. Clearly massive stars are important because they are the strongest contributors to chemical evolution of the galaxy but the low mass stars are equally important because they allow for life as we know it to um, take place and evolve because we need long-lived stars to secure uh, conditions that in the nearby, I mean, orbiting planets that would secure conditions uh, that support life. Now, even though we understand a lot about how stars evolve and die and how chemical elements are produced, there are still uh, several open questions uh, that uh, remain unanswered. Uh, there is, for example, the well-known uh, lithium problem uh, that is um, um, related to Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the issue of the deuterium abundance, even though I will say more about this in my lecture, in my second lecture. Uh, there are issues with the core metallicity of the Sun. And we don't know the details of nucleosynthesis in AGB stars and their contribution to the galactical chemical evolution. We still don't know which stars explode the supernovae and which one end, uh, end, end their lives like uh, white dwarfs. And there are still plenty of details to understand about explosive scenarios in X-ray bursts, novae, supernovae type 1A and so on. Also, uh, there are anomalies in the composition of some pre-solar grains, and again, this is a topic I will mention uh, in my second lecture. And I will also touch upon the origin of heavy elements, particularly for what concerns the S process and the neutron um, source for this process. And then, of course, there is a much debated question as to where the R process takes place, whether it is in uh, neutron star mergers, in supernovae, and so on. And there are many other questions. So clearly, this is still a very rich and lively field. But in order to answer and address these open questions, we need inputs from uh, various uh, fields, astrophysics, plasma physics, atomic physics, and obviously nuclear physics. And it's only the interplay between these different dif disciplines that allows us to uh, tackle these uh, questions. So when it comes to the nuclear physics input, uh, uh, what we want to do is really to measure in the laboratory the cross-sections for the nuclear reactions that take place in stars. And so before we uh, dive into that topic, I want to remind you of the way in which nuclear reactions take place in stars. And of course, much of this will be familiar probably to most of you, but I thought it might be good to set the scene also um, 
to have a common language and to be able to understand what will follow in my lectures and also in the lectures by other um, contributors. So let's consider a generic uh, reaction between uh, um, two nuclear species called here 1 and 2, which lead to the formation of two other species, 3 and 4. Clearly, we're interested in reactions with a positive Q value because these are the ones that liberate energies and are most important from an astrophysical point of view. Um, the cross-section is the probability for a reaction to occur, uh, its dimensions are those of an area, and the unit that we use in nuclear physics is the barn, or indeed its uh, subunits, uh, and uh, one barn is 10 to the minus uh, 24 square centimeters. Now, in general, it is not possible to uh, determine the cross-section from first principle. But all, what we can say is certainly that uh, the cross-section depends on the nature of the force involved. So, for example, if we have uh, a reaction uh, that is dominated by the strong force as uh, one that liberates uh, particles, then we have typically the highest cross sections. If we have uh, uh, radiative capture reactions that are dominated by the electromagnetic uh, force, then the cross section is several orders of magnitude uh, smaller. And finally, the weakest of all are those that involve uh, beta decays and therefore are dominated by the strong the, by the weak force now the other um consideration general consideration that we can make is that cross sections are energy uh, dependent and so they will change for the same reaction depending on the stellar conditions and then the other concept that we need to introduce is that of the reaction rate uh, between uh, these two species, which is uh, the product of the number density of species 1 and species 2, their uh, relative velocity, which also obviously is linked to the energy, and the cross-section. So in a stellar plasma, particles can have a whole spectrum of velocity, so the reaction rate per particle pair, this quantity that we will return to, um, is given by the integral of the velocity, the cross-section, and this is folded by the velocity distribution. Now, during quiescent stellar burning, we are dealing with non-relativistic, non-degenerate gas in thermodynamic equilibrium at a given temperature. So we can say that the distribution of velocity is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which is shown here um, in terms of energy rather than velocity, but obviously the two are closely linked. So basically, we have a kind of almost linear increase. We reach a maximum around an average temperature K or average uh, energy kT. So this is, uh, tells us that the vast majority of particles will have this uh, kinetic energy and then it tails off exponentially at higher energies. So we can then uh, rewrite the expression for the reaction rate in this way where we make the explicit dependence of the cross-section on the energy and we include this exponential term that represents the tail of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So then the total reaction rate is given by this expression and uh, um, the delta Kronecker symbol is included to avoid double counting um, the same species when we have reactions between particles that are from the same species. When it comes to determining how much energy is produced by a given reaction, we can then introduce this energy production rate, epsilon, which is simply the product of the amount of energy released by a single uh, reaction, namely the Q value for that reaction, and the total reaction rate. And uh, it's useful to introduce the concept of mean lifetime of a given nuclear species X against destruction following the interaction with the nucleus A in terms of this uh, quantity, which basically tells us that the higher the probability for two nuclei to fuse together, the uh, shorter will be the survival time for uh, that particular species. And so this is important, uh, for example, in the nucleosynthesis calculations to see how the abundances of elements uh, changes as the star evolves, and also will be important in the S and R process uh, uh, that you will hear about in other lectures.
So essentially, the kind of uh, bottom line message I want to give here is that this quantity, the uh, reaction rate per particle pair, is a key quantity because it determines how much energy is produced during stellar evolution and also how the abundance of uh, um, given nuclear species changes as the star evolved. So this is indeed the key quantity that we want to determine either experimentally or with the aid of theoretical considerations. And clearly, we need to remember that as the star evolve, evolves, the temperature in its core changes. And so we need to evaluate this key quantity for each temperature. So ideally, what we need here is an analytical expression for sigma, because if we have an analytical expression for the cross section, then we can calculate uh, uh, the integral, so this uh, rate, and we have all that we need. Unfortunately, uh, as I said, we do not have uh, a way to tell a priori what the cross-section of a nuclear reaction is going to be, so typically we need to measure that. So let's have a look at uh, um, possible ways in which we can try to express the cross-section from a more theoretical point of view, and then I'll mention how we try and measure these cross-sections in the laboratory. So we're going to focus on direct, i.e. non-resonant reactions, and resonant reactions. And uh, incidentally, I want to highlight the fact that I'm, in, I'm going to focus on reactions with charged particles and I will completely neglect reactions involving neutrons because this will be covered by the lectures uh, by Professor uh, Artemis Spiro. So a non-resonant reaction, for example, a radiative capture that fuses together nuclei A and X and produces a nucleus B with a concomitant emission of a gamma ray, are essentially one-step process. So basically, there is a direct transition from uh, what we call the entrance channel into the final channel, which is the formation of this nucleus B in, uh, with the um, kind of simultaneous emission of a gamma ray. And the cross-section in this case can be expressed in terms of a single so-called matrix element which involves the electromagnetic operator that describes the transition from the initial state to the final state. This process can take place at any energy and it shows a smooth energy dependence in the cross section. And examples of direct processes are stripping, pickup, reaction, charge exchange, Coulomb excitations. Now, in this case, when dealing with charged particles, we have to contend with the presence of the repulsive uh, um, barrier due to the charges of these interacting nuclei. And the height of the Coulomb barrier is, uh, to a first approximation, equal to the product of the two charges. So even for the lighter species, two protons, we have a barrier of uh, about uh, 1 MeV. In fact, it's uh, about 500 kV for two protons, but the order of magnitude is that. Now, the energy available to particles to initiate a reaction clearly comes from the thermal motion. Um, uh, that you know, associated to a given temperature. And here you have a useful expression to calculate the average kinetic energy the particles have in a plasma at a certain temperature T. And uh, to plug in numbers, if we consider the temperature in the core of the Sun, 15 million Kelvin, this translates to average kinetic energies of about 1 kV, uh, whereas in order to attain energies of the order of uh, MeV, we need to have temperatures as high as 10 to the 10 Kelvin, which were um, those characterizing the Big Bang at some point in the early evolution of the universe. So this means that uh, during quiescent burning, uh, kinetic energies are always much less than the height of the Coulomb potential at the Coulomb uh, barrier, and uh, therefore nuclear reactions take place by tunnel effect. Which incidentally is very fortunate because otherwise nuclear reactions would all take place at once, they would liberate a huge amount of energy that would disrupt the star and uh, basically we wouldn't be here today to talk about this. So when uh, dealing with charged particles we need to um, take into account that, as I said, these reactions occur by tunneling uh, 
effect and therefore there is a non-zero probability of tunneling through the barrier even if and particles have energies much lower than kt and if we assume um, completely bare nuclei and zero angular momentum this probability turns out to be an exponentially decreasing function of energy as shown here so this is kind of sizable at high energies but drops exponentially when we go to low energies and this uh, um, eta value contains the product of the charges the as I said, the integral charges of the interacting nuclei, this quantity is called the Sommerfeld parameter, and 2 pi eta is also referred to as the gamma factor, and here you have a numerical expression for it, uh, with mu being the reduced mass in atomic mass unit and E being the center of mass energy, so the energy of interaction between those two particles in their center of mass expressed in kV. So, incidentally, it is precisely this uh, um, kind of energy dependence associated to the tunneling of the Coulomb barrier that determines the exponential drop in the abundance curve of all the elements up to uh, and including iron, as we have seen in one of the previous slides. So, basically, um, this is a nuclear signature of the fact that nuclear reactions that produce elements up to iron involve uh, charged particles and because of these they are characterized by this tunneling um, probability and its uh, exponential uh, drop with low energies. So now back to the issue of how we can express the cross-section. Um, here we have then a cross-section that is um, the product of a number of different factors that we know must be there. The first factor is a so-called geometrical term, this pi lambda square, which uh, takes into account the quantum mechanical nature of the interaction between the charged uh, particles and basically is associated to the de Broglie wavelength of the two particles in the center of mass system. Then we have this probability of tunneling through the Coulomb barrier, as we have seen, which uh, depends on the energy but also on the angular momentum. And finally, the interaction matrix element that describes non-resonant processes. A more user-friendly expression for sigma is the one that I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is given here. It's uh, 1 over E from this de Broglie wavelength. This exponential term that describes the probability of penetrating through the barrier. And uh, this term that is uh, um, defined through this expression, which is the astrophysical S factor. And indeed, the first two terms are of non-nuclear origin. So one is the quantum mechanical interaction, and one is just purely the Coulomb um, kind of interaction. And these indeed carry the strong energy dependence of the cross-section, whereas this quantity contains the strictly uh, nuclear aspects of the interaction, and it has a weak energy dependence, as we'll see um, later. So, this indeed, uh, um, this uh, relationship defines so the astrophysical S factor, which has units of kV barn or MeV barn, and it's uh, a quantity that is often used because typically extrapolations of cross sections are done on the astrophysical S factor. We'll get back to that uh, later. As I said, uh, there is also potentially a dependency on the orbital angular momentum. Um, between the two particles, and if this is non-zero, then we need to take into account a centrifugal barrier that is also important and will affect the probability that two particles will fuse together. So now that we have an expression for the cross-section, uh, we can plug it in into the expression for the reaction rate and we come up with this expression where we have the convolution of these two exponential functions. Now, from an astrophysical point of view, we are interested in finding out the energies at which a nuclear reaction is most likely to occur. So the energies that maximize the reaction rate. And this can be obtained uh, easily by differentiating the exponential, setting it to zero, and finding out the energy E0 that maximizes this integral. So this can be done, and I've shown here the 
numerical values of this energy and also of the kind of energy region and this is shown here and this is what gives rise to the gamma of peak so this is essentially obtained from the convolution of the high energy tail of the maxwell boltzmann distribution and the low energy uh, tail of the tunneling probability um, so the the probability uh, tunnel through the coulomb barrier which as we have seen is also an exponentially decreasing and uh, function of energy so as we go to low energies so the product of these two curves gives rise to the so-called gamma of peak which is centered at this energy which maximizes the reaction rate and obviously has a certain uh, width so this is the energy window of astrophysical interest and uh, um, the key thing to bear in mind is that the gamma of a peak really is a function of uh, the charges through the probability, the tunneling probability, and also the temperature of the plasma. And so uh, clearly it varies depending on the reaction and depending on the temperature. And this is an example of the magnitude, if you like, of the gamma of peak for different reactions at a given uh, temperature. And you can see that clearly it peaks at lowest energies for the lightest species and moves to higher energies at, uh, at when we consider higher z. But also if we consider the integral under the gamma of peak, which essentially is, if you like, so um, the uh, kind of proxy for the rate, because the integral of this quantity here is effectively the integral of the gamma of peak, then if we look at that, we observe how this uh, reaction rate decreases by many, many orders of magnitude as we consider reactions with higher and higher z. And incidentally, this explains why stellar um, evolution proceeds through well-defined stages of nuclear burning. So it starts with the lightest species, hydrogen burning, because these are the ones that effectively lead to a sizable reaction rate. And any other heavier particles present in the plasma will not be involved in any reaction because the probability or if you like the reaction rate decreases by many orders of magnitude and so for these kind of reactions to occur one has to wait for later evolution stages in the star where further contraction leads to increased temperatures which may eventually trigger reactions between heavier z particles and this is why uh, we have separate stages of nuclear burning. I should also mention briefly that uh, uh, low energy reactions in stars are also affected by a phenomenon called electron screening. So when dealing with non-resonant reactions, as we have seen, we have this expression for the cross-section and we have assumed that the nuclei are fully stripped of all their electrons and we have assumed that they are bare. And this is therefore the um, barrier that would feel if nuclei were indeed bare nuclei. However, in stars, in stellar plasmas, we also have electrons that cluster around the nuclear charges. And uh, similarly, in the laboratory, we have electrons around uh, the nuclei in, when they are in their atomic form. So the presence of this uh, electron cloud effectively is such uh, to uh, screen the barrier and lead to enhanced uh, cross sections. This screening potential is typically of uh, the order of 10 to 100 electron volts and so corrections for screening effects are typically negligible unless at ultra low energies where we can see that the um, astrophysical S factor which would normally kind of go down in a fairly linear way, if we had a reaction between bare nuclei, uh, the screen potential increases if uh, we take into account the uh, sc electron screening. And this effect, of course, is higher the lower the energies of interaction. Typically, experimental investigations have led to screening uh, potentials that are often in excess of the theoretical adiabatic limit, and so there are still issues that are not quite clear when it comes to the electron uh, screening. But I won't go any further discussing this, I just want to mention that this is an issue when 
uh, going to very low uh, interaction energies. So now back to how we express cross sections. We have seen the case for non-resonant reactions. Now let's see how we can express cross sections when we are dealing with resonant reactions. And in this case, the expression we'll come up with will be the same for reactions involving charged particles or involving neutrons. So unlike the non-resonant uh, um, reactions, resonant ones are effectively a two-step process. So let's consider a resonant radiative capture where again we have uh, two nuclei interacting forming to leading to the formation of a final nucleus B with emission of a gamma ray. But let's assume that now this process occurs in two distinct steps. One is the formation of a compound nucleus B in this case in an excited um, state. And then after some time, this nucleus undergoes a decay. And this is the second step of this two step process. And specifically in this case, we are assuming that the nucleus de excites by gamma emission into one of the lower uh, excited states or possibly directly to the ground state. In this case, the cross section is the product of two separate matrix elements. One that represents the probability of forming the compound system, starting from the entrance channel A plus X and forming a resonant state in the compound system. And the other one is a term that describes the decay from that resonant state to the final state. Now, unlike the non-resonant process, resonant reactions occur at well-defined energies, namely at center of mass energies that closely match the energy of the resonant state. And because of this, they display a strong energy dependence in the cross-section. Of course, um, one needs to realize that because excited states also have a finite width, there may be contributions to the cross-section also through the wings of these states. Another example also still of a uh, resonant process is a resonant reaction where now the final um, um, kind of channel is the emission of a charged particles, for example, a proton or an alpha particle. In this case, again, we will have a first step that is the formation of a compound nucleus in an excited state. And then the second step will be the decay, this time by particle emission, leading to a different nucleus altogether. Again, the cross-section, sorry, this should be alpha, not gamma, uh, is the product of two matrix elements, one describing the formation of the excited uh, um, state in the compound nucleus, and one describing its decay by alpha emission. And again, this is a process that only takes place as long as the energy in the entrance channel closely matches the energy of the excited state in the compound nucleus. Now, in this case, we do have an analytical expression for the cross section, which is the bright wigner expression, which, uh, strictly speaking, is valid only for a single and isolated resonance. The cross-section again contains the terms associated to the quantum mechanical nature of the interaction. So there is again the uh, De Broglie wavelength. And then we have a term called the spin factor, sometimes indicated with this letter omega, where J in the numerator is the um, spin of the excited state formed in the compound nucleus and J1 and JT are respectively the spins of the projectile and the target. And then we have this term which is what carries the energy dependence of the cross section and here we have the two partial width, one that describes the formation of uh, the compound uh, um, nucleus and one that uh, um, describes the decay of that compound nucleus through a given channel. And then we have here the total width, which is simply the sum of all the partial widths of all possible um, exit channels. And here we have the energy dependence. So clearly when the energy in the entrance channel closely matches the energy of the resonance, these terms goes to zero and the cross section has the highest possible value.
Now, uh, in this case, you may wonder, well, what happens to um, penetrability considerations? So what about the Coulomb barrier and you know, the fact that these are charged particles? Well, this is embedded within the um, partial widths, which are not constant, but they are themselves energy dependent. And their energy dependence can be expressed by this um, expression here where the penetrability comes into play once again. And so you can see that we have a similar trend for these uh, uh, partial widths depending on the angular momentum. Again, these would go um, would become smaller and smaller as the um, orbital angular momentum increases because then there is a centrifugal barrier which further hinders the reaction. Okay, so in this case we now have again uh, the reaction rate which contains the integral of the cross-section times this uh, exponential term that describes the tail of Maxwell Boltzmann, but in this case the expression for sigma is the bright Wigner expression with, which we've just introduced. So if we then integrate over the appropriate energy region then we can say that if the compound nucleus has an excited state or its wing in, in the energy region of interest for astrophysics then uh, the reaction rate will have a resonant contribution. And typically resonances will dominate the reaction rate if they are if they happen to be at the right energy. And the reaction rate will critically depend on re resonant state properties. Okay, so let's now consider three uh, special cases of resonant reactions, namely those proceeding through narrow resonances, those proceeding through broad resonances, and those that involve subthreshold resonances. So a narrow resonance is defined as one whose width is much lower than the energy um, of the resonance itself. And in these cases, we can assume that the Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, um, distribution remains constant within, within the energy range, so within gamma, the width of the resonance. And we can therefore also assume that the partial width for forming and decaying from the compound nucleus are also constant and evaluated at the resonant energy. So in this case the resonant, uh, uh, the uh, reaction rate per particle pair can be calculated exactly and it turns out to have this expression. I just want to uh, notice in particular that because of this exponential term we see that the reaction rate is going to be strongly dominated by low energy resonances, if they are there, uh, because uh, when ER approaches KT, this exponential term has a maximum value. Um, and also notice that any uncertainty on the location of these resonances translates in large uncertainties in the cross-section and therefore in the reaction rate because of this exponential dependency. The other term that appears here is the so-called resonance strength. And this is um, effectively the integrated cross-section of the resonance energy. And uh, the resonance strength is given as the product of this statistical factor and these uh, partial width uh, uh, ratios. Notice that uh, very often one of the two uh, partial widths is much smaller than the other one. So for example, if gamma 1 is much smaller than gamma 2, then the total gamma is essentially gamma 2, so that this ratio reduces to gamma 1. Conversely, or likewise, uh, if gamma 2 is much smaller than gamma 1, then this ratio will be essentially gamma 2. So this means that the resonance strength will be uh, governed by the smaller of the two widths, which makes for additional experimental challenges. In general, when dealing with resonant uh, reactions, the kind of uh, quantities that we want to determine experimentally are precisely these partial widths. Uh, the spin of the compound uh, state that we form through the process, as well as the location of the resonance. And in general, if we are dealing with reactions that involve stable nuclei, many, if not all, of these parameters are still unknown. Um, when uh, um, just again a couple of other considerations. When the gamma gamma width is much larger than the particle width, then the omega gamma 
uh, is dominated by the particle width. And this is a situation that typically occurs for um, uh, resonances uh, located within the first 500 kV in the center of mass system of the interacting particles. In this case, there is a strong energy dependence through the Coulomb barrier penetration in this uh, partial particle width. And therefore, it's only the resonances located within the gamma of peak that really contribute uh, to the reaction rate. In situations where the gamma gamma width is much smaller than the particle width, then we have an omega gamma, which is essentially um, governed by gamma gamma. This typically occurs for resonances um, located at energies higher than 0.5 MeV. And uh, the lowest energy uh, resonances will typically dominate, but in this case, notice that there is no concept of gamma of peak because there is no uh, penetrability, obviously, you know, associated with these gamma gamma values. The second case is that of broad resonances, and this is where the width of the resonance is of the same order as the um, location of the resonance. And in this case, the bright vigna needs to be modified by taking into account explicitly the energy dependence of the partial width. So we end up with an expression like the one shown here, where uh, we have uh, the gamma width of um, the prob probability of forming the um, compound nucleus, which is um, really energy dependent. Notice that if we are dealing with uh, several broad resonances, all with the same j pi, we may also have interference effect, which can be constructive, like for example shown by this solid line, or destructive, shown by this uh, dashed line. And these interference effects must be measured experimentally because uh, they cannot really be um, accurately predicted from theory. Finally, uh, reaction rates may also occur through subthreshold uh, resonances, and these are situations where the compound nucleus has a, an excited state which is just below the threshold of the particles in the entrance channel. And in this case, because any uh, excited state has a finite, finite width, we may still have contributions to the cross-section by the high energy wing of the subthreshold state. A notable example is the carbon-12 alpha gamma, which is uh, uh, one of the most important reactions in astrophysics, and this uh, is affected by contributions from two subthreshold states, which uh, significantly um, kind of um, muddle the water, so it makes they make it very difficult to measure these. Um, cross-section at low energies. So, but in general, the contribution of a low um, subthreshold states is evidenced by the fact that the S factor would typically display an upward trend at low energies. So, as we now have discussed all the possible uh, types of reactions, so we can uh, come to the total reaction rate, which brings together all these contributions. And so, the total rate can be expressed as a sum of all direct uh, uh, transitions, uh, resonant contributions, contributions through the tails of uh, broad resonances or subthreshold states, and indeed interferences between broad resonances. So, finally, we can then um, show that the cross-section would then have a, a shape like the one shown here for charged particles where the uh, there is a smooth non-resonant uh, um, kind of trend uh, on which a number of resonances may be superimposed and similarly for the S factor we have a trend which is not just uh, kind of smooth and linear but might be affected by the presence of narrow as well as broad resonances. Okay, so now that we know how nuclear reactions take place in stars and what their features are, let's have a look at the experimental challenges that we face when performing measurements at um, ideally energies of astrophysical interest. So to recap and to bring it all together, the gamma of peak is the energy window where information on nuclear processes is required. And even though the gamma of energy is much higher than Kt, it still is much lower than the height of the Coulomb barrier, 
And so this implies that reactions take place by tunnel effect and are characterized by extremely small cross sections, which in turn pose many major experimental uh, difficulties. So the procedure that we tend to adopt is to try and measure the cross section over as wide an energy range as possible and then extrapolate to the energies of interest. And this is shown here for the cross section. We have the typical non-resonant trend contribution from resonances and we try and push direct measurements to as low an energy as we can. However, Normally, the energy regions of astrophysical interest, uh, shown here by this dashed line, are typically um, very difficult to access, and so an extrapolation is required. Because the cross-section drops by many orders of magnitude, this extrapolation, traditionally and historically, has always been carried out on the astrophysical S-factor, which, for a non-resonant process, has a much smoother trend and therefore it's generally easier to extrapolate down to the energy of interest. However, as we have seen, if there are uh, contributions from the low energy tails of broad uh, high energy states or maybe narrow uh, resonances in or near the energy region of interest, or indeed if there are contributions from the high energy wing of subthreshold states, then the extrapolation procedure again becomes rather difficult. This is an example of uh, experimental data for a purely non-resonant reaction, and in this case is the extrapolation down to the energy region of interest, which is down here, can be a down, uh, kind of uh, reliable, but in general the situation is much more complicated. Now, I should finally point out that what we measure is not directly the cross-section, but indeed a quantity that is closely related to the cross-section, which is the yield. And the yield, strictly speaking, is defined as the number of uh, reactions that we detect divided by the total number of particles incident on the target. And so the, this yield can be expressed as the product of the cross-section times the um, number density of nuclei in the target times the linear thickness of the uh, target. So in the laboratory we therefore measure the yield as a function of bombarding energy and we extract the cross-section. So whenever a beam impinges on a target of a given thickness it loses energy. And so if we um, assume that the cross-section has a certain shape we need to consider that in going from the in front of the target and traversing it all, the beam will cover a certain energy region, for example this delta E2 in this case, and if the cross-section is constant then it can be taken out of the integral and uh, one can easily calculate the cross-section once we measure the yield. So the yield will be associated to an effective energy that is somewhere uh, midway between the entrance and the exit of the target because the cross-section is constant, which means an equal number of reactions will take place in the first half of the target as they do in the second half of the target. If we have a target that is thicker, such that the uh, beam loses a larger amount of energy, and if the cross-section is not quite constant, but at least very smoothly within this energy interval, then again the yield will be the integral of the cross-section over this energy region, and this can now be associated to an effective energy, which is not quite a midpoint, but it's at an energy that divides this area into equal parts. So clearly the particles at the front of the target will contribute more to the yield than the particles at the back, because by then the cross-section has dropped uh, significantly. So um, in these situations, uh, however, it's relatively straightforward to calculate the, the cross-section based uh, on a measurement of the yield. If we're dealing with resonant reactions, the situation is slightly more uh, tricky. And this is because both uh, the yield will depend strongly on the bombarding energy as well as on the target thickness. So let's consider two extreme situations. One of a thin target where the target thickness, namely the um, energy lost by the beam in going through the target, so this delta E quantity, is much less compared to the natural width of the resonance itself. And then we'll consider the thick target. 
uh, case. So let's consider that, for example, a cross-section for a resonant reaction. And so the cross-section would have this characteristic Breidigner shape. Okay? Let's now assume that the target is thin, so for example 5 keV, compared to the natural width of this resonance, which is uh, this um, quantity gamma here that represents the width of the resonance. We are neglecting in this case any experimental issues like the detector resolutions and all of that. So if we now do a measurement, for example, at a beam energy of 495 kV, okay, so let's assume we start here. Given that the target is 5 kV thick, we would uh, cover all this interval here, and so we would integrate this cross-section of this energy region, and we would end up with a yield that is shown by this uh, um, open circle here. If we repeat measurements at other energies, we will obtain yields at each of those energies. And basically, we can see that the yield curve kind of closely resembles the, the shape of the resonance. The maximum will be obtained at an energy that is very close to the energy of the resonance. And the width will be also very similar to the width of the resonance. What happens now if we're dealing with thick targets, namely targets whose width is much larger than the um, width of the target? In this case, let's consider again the natural th thickness, the natural width of the resonance uh, remains 15 kV, but let's now assume that we're using a target uh, of a given thickness such that the beam loses 50 kV at this bombarding energy. In this case, we have a situation where if we start, for example, at a beam energy of 550 kV, because the beam loses 50 kV in going through the target, we will integrate effectively half the cross-section. So we would obtain a, um, a yield shown here by this symbol at this energy. If we now say double the target thickness then we would obtain a yield which now integrates over the full uh, cross-section curve and so we would obtain a yield which is roughly twice as the previous one. So you can see that by uh, thickening the target more and more the yield then becomes a flat kind of curve, and eventually for an infinitely thick target it reaches a kind of asymptotic um, trend. Now in this case we can still infer important information on the resonance location and its width by looking at the kind of leading edge of this shape and uh, the uh, resonance energy will be located about midpoint of this uh, infinitely thick target yield. Okay, so this value will give us the energy of the resonance and the points between 25 and 75 percent of this slope will give us the target thickness. But what is interesting in this kind of measurement is that the yield for an infinitely thick target effectively gives us directly a measurement of the resonance strength omega gamma. And so these kind of measurements are rather uh, elegant in uh, inferring directly the resonance strength for the cases where resonance is dominate the rate. Okay, so uh, in general, what kind of equipment do we need and what are the requirements? Well, obviously, we need a particle accelerator, so we need an accelerator. We need an ion source that produces the beam species we want to accelerate, and then a, a magnetic analyzer to separate out the species of interest from any impurities, and then um, some elements that will um, help us to focus the beam onto the final target that contains uh, the other nucleus uh, species of which uh, uh, we're in, that we want to let interact with the beam and then we use some detectors placed around the target to uh, collect the radiation produced by the reaction of interest. So in general beams uh, have to uh, ideally have very high beam currents because we have seen cross sections are very small so we want to compensate for that. We want to have beams that can uh, 
typically reach low energies and that can be easily tuned. Uh, and also beams of high purity because we want to avoid as much as possible uh, reactions uh, uh, between contaminants in the beam and our nuclei of interest in the target. As far as targets are concerned, again, we want to have high purity targets, which can be either solid or gas. And we want to avoid contaminants because sometimes even if we have particles per millions of contaminants, if the cross section of the beam with that contaminant is much higher than the cross section we are after, then, of course, that will dominate our measurements. If we're using compounds, then we need to be um, to keep the stoichiometry under control and we may want to choose the thickness uh, appropriately depending on what type of measurements we are interested. And then finally, for the detectors, obviously we need the detectors with high efficiencies and good resolutions to make sure that we optimize our uh, yield measurements. And then finally, a key ingredient is having excellent PhD students because you are the the ones who do most of the work typically. Okay, so this uh, uh, brings me to the end of this lecture. In my next lecture, I'm going to uh, show you how we can mitigate for some of the experimental challenges that I've just mentioned. And then I'll move on to uh, present uh, LUNA, which was the first uh, underground uh, laboratory for nuclear astrophysics in the world. I'm going to briefly highlight some of the key um, past achievements and focus a bit more in detail on some recent results before um, closing off with future perspectives. That's all for now and I'll see you in my next lecture. Thank you.